This time on Norfolk Perspectives, Amtrak's coming to Norfolk, but there was a whole lot of work to get ready for it. We're going to talk about that. Nauticus, more importantly, a very special person at Nauticus, got a chance to go aboard ship by winning a contest. Northside Skate Park Jam Competition, and I think I might learn how to ride or stay on a skateboard. And National Philanthropy Day is coming, and yes, you do have a role to play in that. Stay tuned for a lot of great stuff right here on Norfolk Perspectives. Welcome to Norfolk Perspectives. I'm Bob Batcher. I got a really special guy in the sofa who I've been wanting to get on the sofa for a long time because he and I work together on the light rail project. Paul Fillion, Transportation Construction Project Manager. How's it going? Very good. We are doing a lot of construction for transportation oriented uh, uh, business, so you're a busy guy. Yes, sir. Okay, Amtrak's coming to town. You got a ticket yet? Not yet, but uh, we've got an inaugural train plan for December 11th. Uh, that we've got some VIPs coming down, including the governor, um, to uh, kick off the new service. Uh, the new service is going to start uh, December 12th, 12, 12, 12 is the magic date, and uh, we're excited. A lot of folks I talk to on a regular basis cannot wait to have the train in service uh, out of Norfolk. It is really awesome, and I know that there's a lot of people at Amtrak that are very excited about it, too, and people with the Navy, and people that go to D.C. all the time, and people, so it's exciting. Sure, yeah. Okay. Um, Obviously, it was a piece of cake because, once again, we take rail lines that are owned by Norfolk Southern and a variety of other railroads that are going through town anyway, and all we're doing is putting a different train on it, right? Right. No. I mean, for part of it, but it took a lot of work to get yeah, there. Yeah, there's, there's a huge partnership that, that's happened behind the scenes with uh, the Department of Rail and Public Transportation as the main sponsor for increasing uh, train activity throughout the uh, state of Virginia. Uh, the partnership that uh, we have set up is uh, it, it took a long time to get folks to uh, define the route and set up new service, but the, the partnership involves uh, DRPT, Department of R Rail and Public Transportation. Say, you can it yourself, Paul. Now, name them all. Okay. Yeah, Department of Rail and Public Transportation. That's, the, that's the group run by uh, former Congresswoman Thelma Drake, yes, right? Yes, sir. We've got uh, Norfolk Southern, okay. that's also a partner, Amtrak that's going to be physically running the trains and the service out of Norfolk, and CSX, which is another partner that makes uh, further connections throughout the state. Okay. Now, Norfolk Southern and, and CSX, it's been a long, long time since they had a passenger train. So what part of the pie do they have? They've got, uh, we haven't seen passenger trains in the region since 1977. The, wow. Uh, yeah, it's been quite some time. Um, the uh, feasibility of making this happen was is neat. The way it, it played out is basically using existing main lines between CSX and Norfolk Southern, tying in a few connections to, to tie those two, uh, you know, major train stakeholders together, and then adding a few spurs and some train controls and utilizing existing systems throughout Virginia. Um, with the addition of more, a little bit more infrastructure to tie them all together and set up new service out of Norfolk that you know hasn't been seen in you know over 30 years. Okay, now you make it sound like a piece of cake, but if you've got a people train and one of those 200 car coal train, who wins? They they uh, basically time lock in uh, train spots so they can have continuous service for the p uh, passenger train and consistent service. Um, we're set up for Norfolk to have arrival um, close to 9 o'clock at night, every night, um, with the exception of Saturday. It comes in a little later, closer to midnight. Now you'll arrive? Uh, arrive uh, from, actually from Petersburg, from D.C., Richmond, via Petersburg, the 460 corridor, uh, across the river into Harbor Park, roughly at 9 p.m. And okay, then the, so it's sitting there. And all of a sudden, the coal train comes. What happens? Yeah, we've got an extra spur that we put in place, okay. some switches. We actually put in a third uh, track over in the Harbor Park area to safely pull the train off to the off the main line, allow passengers to board and, and deboard, and then we we quickly get back up on the main line and we found a home for storing the trains overnight, um, which is in train term terminology was development of a Y that allows us to turn the train physically around off the main line, store it overnight and uh, do some minor service 
uh, inside the cars, tidy them up for the next day service, and then bring the train down in Harbor Park. Okay, because with light rail, he gets to the end of the run, and the driver goes from the front to the yes to the new front and drives it the other way. Yes, they don't do that. He can't do that unless you have a massive turntable or a <laughs> massive rail yard, which we didn't really have the opportunity to use that. Um, so you, you have what they call a Y train terminology, which is a triangular section of track that allows you to basically do a three-point turn in a train, turn, or, turn oh, a train cool. around, reverse it, and set it up in the opposite direction. Okay, now, this is all going to start December 12th. December 12th. But how do they know they can do it? We've, uh, for the last year, we've been doing all kinds of track work and um, prep work to set up the service. Um, as of last Friday, we've been qualifying Amtrak trains uh, on the system between Petersburg and Norfolk and actually using the new Y and the new track work and the new switches and controls that we have in place. So we're in the, uh, we're in the qualification mode of crews and trains and looking at the, uh, the quality of construction right now. Okay, so the big question, Paul, quality of construction, qualifying. Last week, December, you, this, the, it, we were set for December 12th. Yes. Today, are we still set for December 12th? Yes, sir, December 12th, 12, 12, 12, 12. <laughs> That's a good sign. Yeah. And I think we've been showing the pictures of the new stations can be built. Yeah. So there's all kinds of new infrastructure. The bottom line is go to the Amtrak website. AmtrakVirginia.com. And buy a ticket to get out of town. Right. Thanks a lot, Paul, for making it seem so easy. It's, it's exciting. There's a lot of people looking forward to it. Thanks for having me. When we come back, we're going to be talking to a really cool gal who got a trip to Turkey or someplace like that. Stay tuned and find out how. Welcome back to Norfolk Perspectives. I got to tell you, you are in for a treat. Susie Hill is on the sofa, and it's so cool because she's got about three hours worth of material she's going to cover in six minutes. So I'm going to start off by saying, if you haven't heard enough from Susie, go to Nauticus and ask for Susie Hill. Susie, you've had the opportunity for the last how many years now at Nauticus? Um, I've been there about 15. To share your enthusiasm mm -hmm. for the exploration of the seas to every Norfolk kid that has come through Nauticus. Mm -hmm. Did you realize that? Yep. Yeah, it's awesome. So, we sent you out of the country. Right. Mm -hmm. To go to Bob Ballard's what? Um, I got the opportunity. I applied for their Educator at Sea program through Ocean Exploration Trust. That's Bob's organization. And oh, I, it's Bob. Uh, excuse me. Do Dr. Ballard. <laughs> Let me be professional. Dr. Ballard's um, organization called Ocean Exploration Trust, and that is his organization that funds all of his exploration. Also, he's got supporters through NOAA. And all of his educators this year were funded through what's called the Bechtel Foundation. Now, so, Bob, mm -hmm. others know him as Dr. Dr. Ballard, Ballard yes. is known for kind of finding this little relic under the mm -hmm. sea, right? Back in 1985, yes. Yeah, just the a little Titanic. Thing. Yeah. But it, that's not the only one he's found. He's found many of them. He's been over 120 expeditions. Um, and this one is just one to add to the list of his different... But it's more than just being a treasure hunter. Mm -hmm. I mean, right? I mean, his yeah, whole... Yeah, and he actually doesn't consider himself as a treasure hunter. And the whole team that's in Ocean Exploration um, Trust, they don't consider them as treasure hunters because they are explorers. Um, the ship that he um, has is called the Exploration Vessel, or EV Nautilus. And he uses his ship to go out there and explore less than 10%, I think it is, um, of the world's oceans have been unexplored. So he, amongst other explorers that are out there, um, go out there and explore anything they can find. And um, the time I was out there, um, I got to go in the Mediterranean and the Black Sea. Um, the Black Sea they did first. I actually did the Mediterranean and Aegean legs of the cruise is what they call it. And they were exploring for anything biological, chemical, geological, archaeological. We found everything from two worms to squid and clams. Did you say 
You have this accent. Did you say tube worms? Tube worms, yes. What is a tube worm? Tube worms are these organisms that live deep in the ocean and just like plants yeah. would survive off of the energy from the sun, these guys actually live around what are called seeps, and they feed off the chemicals that are feeding out of um, the floor of the ocean. Well, they sound like pleasant and, beasts. <laughs> and they do what's called chemosynthesis. So see, um, and I got my ocean my biology degree from ODU. So chemo, who? Chemosynthesis. Is so that similar to photosynthesis? photosynthesis okay. They get energy from the sun, they get energy from chemicals. So chemosynthesis. And so they saw those. They also are um, these going to be lessons learned for future <laughs> life. Um, I think so. Yes. Yeah. 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 Okay. I, I have it on a reliable source that this was not a contest you won. I mean, you worked hard. Right. Yes, this. I and had worked, to apply for it. And you did not work hard for this for Susie Hill's benefit. Right. It wasn't for me. It was for Nauticus and for anybody who wants to explore. So what did you bring back? Besides some awesome stories, I bet. Yep, stories. Um, unfortunately, um, we weren't able to take any samples uh, while we were out to sea, so I couldn't bring any ancient storage and forage jars back with me. <laughs> kind of lucky there. <laughs> yeah. Um, but, yeah, lots of good stories, lots of pictures. We were able to do a live broadcast at Nauticus. So uh, when I was on the ship, it was me and Dr. Ballard and then also Dr. Katie Croft-Bell. Um, she's the vice president of Ocean Exploration Trust. She's also one of their expedition leaders. Um, we got to talk to people back at Nauticus oh, and cool. tell them about their trip as well as they could answer questions and send them in. And we were able to talk to them live. Is it going to kind of be filtered into some of the new classes, Net, that you're teaching there? Um, one of the requirements as an educator at CI do have to develop a lesson plan. Um, so I will be doing that, as well as we are planning on turning our annual Cub Scout Boy Scout Day at Nauticus into an ocean exploration theme. Cool. So that'll be on December 8th, so you'll have to invite me back. To <laughs> there we go, deal. yeah. <laughs> and let, let um, we'll just tie it all into that. There's a lot of people that are saying farewell to the space program. Mm -hmm. And yet there were a lot of people that said, you know, we've kind of missed our own exploration. There's still a lot of opportunity for exploration this season there. Right. Um, Dr. Ballard works out of University of Rhode Island as well as amongst other um, different institutions that are doing that ocean exploration. And he has started telepresence, which means he can use that to talk to other um, places live through video um, and through satellite. And his place is called the Inner Space Center versus the Outer Space oh, okay. Center. So he's got the Inner Space Center at University of Rhode Island, and that uses the satellites to send information from the ship over to them and then they send it out to their live website which is nautiluslive.org and then um, also through different places that can host live broadcasts like we did at Nauticus. So where we talk about uh, uh, Nauticus, the Maritimes, I mean it, it is an entertainment venue but mm -hmm. there's a real strong education component in there. Right. So yes. this is really the investment in that education. Yes, we are an education facility. Uh, we are a museum that focuses on it. One of the activities we do um, on a daily basis during the summer as well as on the weekends um, at Nauticus is our ROV workshops, which are remotely operated vehicles. They've never let me get near one of them. Oh, you need to film one. Right. Um, they wouldn't let me touch the real one. Um, <laughs> I'm six either. <laughs> I was so tempted. But Peter hasn't trained you on how to drive them real well? Um, I know how to do the ROVs at Nauticus. We give different families, scouts, summer campers. Yeah, it's all a real groups. experience. We teach them about how But it doesn't qualify there. you for Mr. Ba Dr. Ballard? Um, what qualified me was going to ODU for my biology and oceanography. <laughs> But then also different experience, my interest in oceans and able to, um, as being an educator, we teach different um, subjects such as ocean exploration to our guests. Um, but I've also got that public speaking ability. Our, one of our main jobs was that we were commentators for their Knowledge Live website and we were what's called on watch. So their website, while they were out to sea, was 24-7 broadcasting what they were doing so people can study and follow along what they are exploring. So when they found like the Aratus then you see Seamount um, shipwreck for the first time, Whoa. people got excited. So people got to explore the first time of that shipwreck the same time I did and the scientists. And what was cool about Dr. Ballard when he was on there is he, he kind of stood back behind the scenes. He went in there to check in it, but he let the scientists do their thing and 
Because it's not just about him. It's about the whole team. That's so cool. So. Okay, we got 30 seconds okay, left go to talk about what's on the table with the plaque. Because in addition okay. to going to the Mediterranean and doing all this stuff, you've got a, I got to tell you, that looks like a potato chip bowl with starfish. Yes. <laughs> you can actually get this at Virginia Aquarium. <laughs> okay. It's out of their gift shop. Um, Nauticus partnered up with the Elizabeth River Project in the schooner Virginia to do a partnership camp called Elizabeth River Adventures Camp. We did five weeks during the summer and it all hosted around river ecology, partnerships between them. We sailed on the schooner Virginia. We built um, ROVs and uh, watched movies and different things at Nauticus. We toured the battleship. And then also the Elizabeth River Project, they got to visit the Learning Barge. So in between all that, we won an award through the Hampton Roads Alliance of Environmental Educators called the Fostering Partnership Award because we partnered together to create that camp and hopefully we'll that get to do so it again. Cool. There is so much energy going on at Nauticus. I encourage people to come down to Nauticus, look up Susie Hill directly, ask for her. They'll get you out of a class to come see That's a okay. viewer. And I want you to hang tight, stay on the sofa sure. so you can be with us for the skater dude coming up. <laughs> stay tuned okay. for more. The first day stepping on the court, I couldn't keep up. That motivated me to step up my game. When I reach a goal, I set a new one the next day. And my next goal is to go to college. Mastering the court takes persistence. So does getting into college. I've got what it takes. So do you. Welcome back to Norfolk Perspectives. I, this is, I, I don't know what to say. Susie, you've invited these skate dudes with you here. Mm -hmm. They're not. They're, call, man. they're not skate dudes. <laughs> they're, uh, they're parks and rec employees. They look like skate dudes. Mm -hmm. You're not a skate dude, right? In, in my younger years. <laughs> <laughs> Rob Ramos, this is your encore performance on Norfolk. And it's so cool because you came on to promote something with the skateboard thing. It's go skate you, day. Yeah, and yeah. you knew where the park was. Mm -hmm. But I sensed you really hadn't been on a skateboard. Um, at that point, I've done a little bit. I've taught younger kids that have never been on one, so I can stand on it. I can move with it, but tricks-wise, yeah. I can okay, so how many tricks you got in your background now? Uh, one. <laughs> so it stays with one. So is that why you brought Ryan Binkley with you? Yes. He's one of our um, brick aides at the skate park, and he's one of the guys that's you know, been there for, for forever since we've opened it. And you know, He's a great skateboarder. You can teach the kids, you know, you can help out with anything and everything, so. Okay, I want to go on record from the get-go that I want to make good TV here and have you teach me a trick, and okay. they wouldn't let me get off the, the chair. Yeah. They banned me. Are you relieved? Uh-huh, yeah, a little. A little? Okay, I got to ask you, do you have the string around your neck with the, with the, with the uh, skate key? Huh? Oh, no. Do you know, you, do you even know what I'm talking about? No. no I didn't think so. The, we used, when, no, you wouldn't know either. When I was a kid, you had the, the four wheels that attached to the bottom of your sneakers, and you had a skate key to tighten it up. And then what happened was those four wheels went from your sneakers to a board. Hmm. Hence, skateboard. You learn stuff on Norfolk <laughs> Perspectives. Now, you're going to teach me. What are these? Um, those are actually artwork that's been done by kids They're and awesome. adults. Yeah, uh, we had a, uh, a paint the deck party day uh, a couple weeks ago where we had about 100 people come out and they actually spray painted, with the help of ODU students as well, spray painted cool. these metal decks and they've created different designs from their names uh, to flowers to just shapes to skate or biker on that one or even, you know, cool uh, designs like that with the moon and the sun. So but we, where we are had the a wheels? wide. They're, they're actually going to be used for something different. Um, what it is is that Ooh. we have an art project in the works um, that we will be finishing up on the 10th of November um, that we're going to unveil at the uh, competition. So it's going to be a big tree. Um, these are the branches that you see in front of you that's going to act as shade for the kids. So it actually gives them something shaded uh, inside the park and also gives them something to look at that they've actually created themselves. That is so cool. Yeah. And then on uh, the 10th, there's also going to be a jam competition. Yep. Yep. Uh, now, we, 
This isn't the uh, <laughs> Smucker Brothers, right? No, no, okay. no, it's not. Just, sorry. It just gives the, the kids a chance to, and the adults too, a chance to show out their skills and compete against um, other adults and, and youth as well. And just you mean kind of. So I could come out there? You could, you could. Okay. It's kind of like a king of the park that, type. That's a look thing. of fear on his eyes. <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah that, that, the mic picked up that agreement. Who, who's mainly using the park, Brian? Um, uh, all kinds of kids go there, mostly skateboarders. So you can tell, okay, how can you tell that you're going to be in trouble because this kid doesn't know how to use it? I mean, what's the first telltale sign that you need to work with a kid? Um, you can usually tell if they've, like, fallen off a few times when they got in there or they just look unsure of themselves. Okay, so <laughs> the look that I have in my face of sheer panic would probably... Yeah. What's the oldest person you've had in there? Um, I've seen some pretty old ones there, like 50s. You're heading into trouble. <laughs> <laughs> okay, you've got a skateboard that doesn't look like anything like this one. I take it that's a first love of it. No, this is my personal skateboard. Wow. Yeah, it's, it's all You've had some up. accidents on that. Yeah. Being used and abused. I know it. <laughs> okay, now, where I say you've had accidents on that, are those just encounters? You no, this is right? uh, from, like, grinding and sliding on rails. Do you know what grinding means? No. It's, uh, <laughs> like, you, like, ollie up onto the rail and grind on your truck. See, wouldn't it be cool if we could stand up and do that? Yeah. <laughs> okay, so how do you, okay, th that's, so going on a rail is, is, is you can do it. Yeah. But how do you go from the, how do you get up there and uh, not have your feet fall off the board? Just pop the tail and push forward. Pop the tail? Yeah, you just pop it off the ground. It takes years of practice. It does. Can you do that, Rob? <laughs> no, no, I can't. Can you do that? No way. Your, kid can, your son can do that, though, right? Uh, he, he's a beginner. Beginner, beginner. Okay, so <laughs> come on out on November 10th and all skill level, including Rob and I? Yeah. Come out there if you want. <laughs> <laughs> Boy, that was that was real conditional. Mm -hmm. Super. Okay, and and come out there is Northside Park. Yep. On Tidewater Drive. Yep. yep. The park's been a great success, hasn't it? Oh yeah, for for two years now, you know, it's been bringing kids that are skating all over the place actually to one central location. So it's been a big hit, and especially this past year. And you know, the numbers are actually jumping more than what we've seen in the past two years, really. So. And back it's in those days where I talked about screwing the four wheels from the <laughs> skates onto a board, they said it was going to be a passing fad. Yep. What would you say is the future of skateboarding? Mm, I have no idea. Yeah, that's the beauty of it. <laughs> yeah. You know what? Because we really don't care what the future is. But because it's going to grow and be in the, in the minds of a creative kid. Yeah. Thanks for everything that you guys are doing. To, who would have thought? Leaves. When we come back, we're going to be talking about... I don't know how to make this transition from skateboarding to philanthropy. Stay tuned. Welcome back to Norfolk Perspectives. I got Joy Iroll here, who is the development director for Nauticus. How are you doing? Great. How are you? Okay. What's the segue from... Did you have From a key? Nauticus to um, a philanthropy day? Yeah. <laughs> well, actually, um, I am an, a member of the Association of Fundraising Professionals. I do the fundraising at Nauticus along with my team. So that's your segue. That's there we how go. we're connected. Okay. And have you been on a skateboard? <laughs> I have not been on a skateboard, but I did have skates with keys. Um, so you were, knew what I yes. was talking about. And when about. I had them, they were 20 years old. So. <laughs> oh, thanks. So... <laughs> Joy, when I think of ph philanthropist, I think of, you know, the big guys, the Rockefellers, the uh, those kind, of, the Battens. Right. I don't right. think of Bob Batcher. Well, no, philanthropy can be anyone. It can okay. be youth, um, like the Girl Scout Council, or the skateboarder that was on, or the skateboarder that was here. Yes, um, we recognize youth philanthropists. We uh, for the AFP Ph Philanthropy Day. 
Uh, we're recognizing people like uh, the, the Birdsong family. Now that's who you're usually thinking of when you think philanthropists. Right. Um, but it can be a professional fundraiser. Um, we're honoring those types of people. We're honoring the volunteer fundraiser, like a Wayne Wilbanks at this event. Uh, BB&T corporations, we're, we're honoring them. Foundations like the Obesey Fund, Healthcare Foundation. So uh, philanthropy extends beyond those that have tremendous wealth to those that have just a few cents to give every day. Because isn't part of it is caring and then connecting? Caring, connecting, fundraising is about um, having a passion ha for your mission, finding the right person to buy into your mission, and having that person become passionate about your mission, and then they want to in turn support it with their time or their treasure. Yeah, I was, I was just at an event. I am seeing an event that was a, an auction mm -hmm. for art, and I was amazed that uh, the, some of the things that they, they weren't bidding on what the retail value was. But the minute you mentioned some kind of cause, there was an emotion and an energy and lots of money was spent. Exactly, exactly. And when, when we as fundraisers can find that exact niche um, and uh, it, it just great things can happen from it because ultimately programs are supported and great things happen from our programs. Now in what we're hearing, you know, for the last uh, five, six years, we've been in the dumper. The economy's bad, woe is us, and yet we're still doing things like the Ray and Joan Croc Center is, has been mm -hmm. received donations. The Chrysler Museum of Art is free because of people who are willing to give. Right, right. So there seems to still be that. Well, there is always a tradition of giving. People will give no matter how bad the economy is. Um, and good fundraisers plan for those bad times and they make plans and when it, when the dollars become less their efforts expand so they're reaching out to more people to give give money and that way we can sustain those programs um, those, those programs we support through the fundraising effort so when you get that phone call that's just really <laughs> that's not even really fundraising is it the, the actual phone call Fundra fundraising starts from the minute you meet a person whether or not you're there on a fundraising call um, it's about relationships mm -hmm. it, it could be my I, I can support uh, the Girl Scouts, for example. I have an affinity with them. I've been a Girl Scout since I was seven years old. So they know that probably I'm going to be able to give to them or give to them because of my affiliation or affinity for them. And uh, once you have that established, the ask comes easy, easily. So if you're, if you're involved in an organization or you enjoy the delivery of services from an organization that relies on fundraising or you are fun want to be a fundraiser, where, where, do you sh where should you be on November 14th? On November 14th, you should be at the Waterside Marriott in Norfolk for the AFP National Philanthropy Day. It's being hosted by the Hampton Roads chapter of the AFP, and it is a luncheon. Uh, the sponsor, the presenting sponsor is the Curtis Group. The lead sponsor is the Kellogg Organization, and I know that AFP could use more sponsorship. So if you have that ability and want to be at Philanthropy Day, please see the organizers or call the organizers of it. Now, if you're in a group of people and they want to do some really good things but they don't have any money, what should you do? <laughs> Start building relationships and, uh, and also find a good grant writer or somebody who's a great writer um, because that will, that will help Im immensely too. So. so where there's a will, there's a way there's when there's information. There's always a way. There's okay. always a way and, and there's always someone out there that wants to do great things. Joy, thanks a lot. Uh, i got a skateboard waiting I for know. me out in the parking lot. <laughs> we want to hear from you what you'd like to see on TV48, but more importantly, what's going on in your neighborhood? Give us a holler, 664-6510. And as usual, it's a wonderful time to be in Norfolk just because of you.